This podcast is brought to you by Pearson, the company behind the self, Goldman Fristo, and the brand new PPVG5 and EVG3. These new easy to use vocabulary assessments are brief and reliable for children aged two and a half all the way up to adults aged 90 and beyond. Learn more about these new tests at pearsonclinical.com backslash exceptional. Welcome to Talking with Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined by Chris Bouguet. How are you doing, Chris? I'm sorry, Rachel. I can't talk right now. I'm watching a TV show on Netflix. You are? Which TV show? Well, I just stumbled upon it. Hold on. Let me pause it. Give me a second. Okay, there. Okay, ready for this? It's called Emoji Genius, right? So I was flipping through Netflix, as people do, and there's this new show called Emoji Genius. I'm like, what is this? It's a, it's a game show. And I started watching it, and I realized this show is all about iconicity. It's all about the stuff we've talked about in the past in this podcast. It's all about interpreting images. So have you seen it? Have you heard about the show? I have not. I'm really intrigued. What's it all about? So like I said, it's a game show where there's like these two different couples and they compete against each other, guessing what emojis mean when they combine different emojis together, what the secret message is, you know? The fun part about it and why I'm bringing it up on this podcast is because it's totally what we talk about, that the picture symbols, and I mean, emojis are essentially picture symbols, right? Yeah. And they're just the modern day picture sim- symbols that everyone uses. And when you think about emojis, when you put them together, they often could tell a story or they could um, have some sort of meaning, some sort of either phrase that you're trying to say, or at least just one word that you're trying to say. And that's the whole point of this whole show. Just like uh, many of our students, emojis don't have text underneath them. And many of our students are, are still learning to become literate. And so they're not yet reading what the, the text means. So they're just looking at the picture symbols that are on AAC devices without having it, understanding what the text is underneath. So the, the analogy is, it was screaming at me when I saw this show and I was like, I got to check this out because it's exactly what we talk about, you know? Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think it's such a good point. I have done the exercise of, um, on a lot of the apps, you can change the design or the display to have icon only. So it's so interesting because you can put an AAC device in front of an adult and say, okay, like build me a sentence, you know, communicate something to me. And they can say, you know, I see you or whatever. But when you take the labels away and it's icon only, it's so much harder. Um, And I think it's just, it's so important to go through that experience to really understand what a new AAC user who is not literate yet, um, what they experience. It's so fascinating to me. You know, we have these symbols and they represent words and we take all of those things for granted, but it's so interesting how that works. Now, I'm not really motivated to see these people continue to struggle, but I guess because I'm thinking of it, it's like my homework, my job. Like I have to watch this show now, this Emoji Genius. Uh, Rachel, I'm just not feeling it. I don't know if I want to get through the rest of the, the episode, you know? I mean, Chris, I how, how are we going to motivate you? I don't know. Maybe if there's like some sort of, if I got some sort of reward, that could be one way to get through the the thing. I I don't know. (laughs) But that's what this whole episode is about, right? We're really talking about motivation, you know. Rachel, have you ever heard this comment from somebody? Has anyone ever said, yeah, the kid's just not motivated to use his AAC device? I hear that all the time and it drives me insane. We all are motivated by something. And even children who appear not to be motivated, or I think a lot of times you hear that when a child's motivation might be fleeting, you know, they're, they're interested in one thing. And then, you know, you go to try to have them communicate or you model on the device and then they drop that and they pick something else up that they might be interested in. Um, But it's really, really important to figure out what is this child motivated by? Because as we know, if there's not, not clear motivation, communication doesn't happen. Um, and I'm really excited for today's episode because we're, we're, we're doing a deep dive into motivation. So Rachel, that just sparked something in me. So yeah, I know many students that will go into a classroom, they'll walk to an area, pick something up, explore it for mm, under 10 seconds, maybe put it down, go over, walk over something else, pick something up, look at it, explore it for maybe 10 seconds. And what you just said just kind of sparked a new term for me. 
maybe micro motivations, you know, like a student was motivated to go over and explore this thing. He just was only motivated to do it for a limited amount of time. Like, like I said, under 10 seconds, but then he became motivated to go look at something else. I don't know. What do you think about that concept? I think that's genius. Um, and I, I, I feel like there's so many kids that I can think about right now who have those micro motivations. And I think one of the common threads with those kids is that they like fast paced things. So the kid who picks something up for 10 seconds then moves on, um, you know, you need to keep your therapy and the things that you're doing really fast paced. Um, and I think that that's a strategy that you can use with those kinds of kids, because if you're constantly introducing new stimuli, um, you know, it's, it's really exciting and it might keep their attention. Um, I'm thinking about a kiddo that I have on my case right now. Um, we were working on the word out and I just had this really fun bag and I just kept pulling things out of it and I was doing it so quickly. Um, otherwise he would have been gone, but I was like, Oh, let's take this out. And I pulled something out. Let's take something else out. Um, and I kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And he was so interested and so engaged. Um, so I think it's just, that's one of the strategies for those kids. You know, it's hard to maintain their attention. They're constantly moving on to the next thing. Take it up a notch and make your, make your therapy super fast paced and see if that helps. Yeah, I love that as a strategy, as opposed to the idea of saying, yeah, the kid's just not motivated by anything. That feels like throwing your hands up in the air and just blaming the student, you know, as opposed to saying, hmm, what can I do different to motivate the student? And you just gave a great suggestion. It's like, I can change my therapy to make it more fast paced. That's something I can try to change the motivation level for the student. Absolutely. And it's our job to figure out how to adapt our therapy to make it motivating for kids. Um, you know, I, I would never say to a parent or a teacher or anybody, I would never say, oh, they didn't do anything for me because they're not motivated. Because to me, it's like, okay, well, I couldn't figure out what they were motivated by. Like, that's my fault. So I don't know. Yeah. What do you think, Chris? I, I think there's tons of ways to, to try and motivate students. And if it doesn't, if you're not hitting on it, you just keep trying. And you might brainstorm with other people about different ways to motivate them. I mean, we, you and I have talked about the concept of sabotage or communication temptations as ways to get kids, kind of entice kids into, into saying more words or trying to at least be connected with you in the situation. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing actually that just popped into my head too was what if the child that you're working with is only motivated by the iPad, for example? I have a lot of parents that are like, oh, like that's the only thing he'll, he'll, he'll do is the iPad or games or videos or things like that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, clinicians feel like, oh, they feel like that's a bad thing to be using those kinds of technologies in their sessions. And for me, there's a very specific way you can use technology like videos, for example, in a way that's really engaging. The most important thing is that you're in charge of the iPad. So whenever I'm working with a fun game or a video, I'm always holding the iPad and that way I can set up communication opportunities. So a lot of times when you play a video, the child's so engrossed with the video that they're not you know, really looking at you or trying to communicate anything. They're just watching the video, but you can very easily hit pause, turn the, the iPad around and then, you know, model something on the device. Like more is a very simple one to play more. Um, you can also with kids who are a little bit, you know, more advanced linguistically, you can ask them, you know, what happened and, and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of ways that you can have technology be incorporated into your sessions. That's really dynamic and opens the door for conversations and communication. Well, I like what you said there is that you're, you are still using what a student is motivated by. You're not eliminating that, which means you're sort of meeting them halfway. Like we're going to, we're going to use the technology that you really like, but I'm going to be the one that holds it. And then we're going to, again, we're going to have this shared experience. Is that, is that what you're, you're getting at? Absolutely. And I think it's really important to remember that because a lot of times when you put a device or a game in front of a child, um, you then lose that connection with the child. And so if you're able to be in control and maybe turn the, the device over, I do a lot of things that kind of break that like trance that kids have when they're staring at a screen. Um, and then what do they do? They look up at me. 
And that's what I want. And then I'm saying, you know, oh, like that was so fun or that's cool. Or sometimes I'll, I'll do some really fun commenting language. Um, but it's just really, really great to maintain that connection. I will say the caveat for kids, this sometimes is hard for them to wrap their head around. A lot of times kids are used to being handed off devices. And so when you take control, um, a lot of times kids are like, what? Like, and they, they'll I'll be in a physical tug of war with kids sometimes because they're used to push, pushing all the buttons that they want. And um, so that takes some time for kids to kind of readjust to me being in charge of the iPad. But after that happens, kids are really responsive and really excited. Um, and there's so many communication opportunities, not just expressively, but also receptively. Um, you know, having kids find certain things on the screen or um, following, you know, one or two step directions. There's a lot of really great apps for home routines that you can use too, like Play Home is one of the ones that I'm thinking of. Um, they're really, really great for targeting so many different areas. Rachel, let me ask you, when a student comes in and you're trying to figure out what they are motivated by, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you talk to the parents and try and get a list? Do you like, a, like an inventory or do you just kind of have your go-to uh, therapy items that you try or all of the above? What, what are some strategies? So on my intake form, there's two questions that I think are really important. One is my child is most motivated by dot, dot, dot. Um, so I oftentimes have an inclination as to what they like. Um, the second one is if I could change anything about my child's communication, it would be dot, dot, dot. Um, so those two things are the most important things on that form for me because one, I need to know where the parent's coming from and what they like to see change so that I'm able to build a really good rapport with the parent. Um, and I'm able to get a lot of insight into what they would like to see change first or change the most. And then of course the motivators, I really, it takes a lot of the legwork out of it for me. If, especially these kids with autism with very specific interests, um, if parents can say, oh, they, you know, they like trains, um, you know, maybe I don't have a train, but I have some type of vehicle that, you know, would be really interesting to them, you know, but in addition to things that kids really like, there's all types of things that I use to explore. Technology is one of them because it's so motivating. I love using augmented reality um, and, and really interesting technologies that kids might not have seen before because um, sometimes that's enough to get them really intrigued and excited. So I think there's a lot of different things that you can do. The kids with autism that I work with, a lot of times sensory is really motivating for them. So I won't do my session in my office. I'll go next door to the playground and we'll sit on the swing. Um, so I think it's just being flexible um, and really trying to follow a child's lead to try to figure out what's really exciting and what's really motivating for them. And it changes day to day and moment to moment too. So I think it's just that that's the most important thing is that you're really perceptive and you're not setting limits. Um, if I were setting limits, I'd say, okay, like here are the five things that I think you might like out of my toy bag. And, and I think that's where we get into problems is we try to make kids excited about something. And sometimes kids aren't like averse to it, right? They're just not super excited about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would imagine a lot of people say that food is, is motivating. And, I, and when, you're, when they're filling out that form for you, I would imagine a lot of people are thinking of the external motivators, you know, like, like food, like a game, like something that's out there that, that I want to, to get. And so, like, I think of my own kids or even me, right, my, as a person, what are some external motivators? Well, I got to go to work because I got to get money to, to feed my family and to have a house and have, have things I like, I like to have. And so the money is a motivator to go to work. And that's one complete set of ways to motivate somebody is external motivators. But then I wonder about this other side of it, which would be like the internal motivators is that like, why did I choose to be a speech language pathologist? Or why did I decide to do the Talking With Tech podcast or start the AT Tips cast back in the day, one of my other podcasts? Is there wasn't necessarily a, an external motivation to do that, right? It was more like I just felt like I needed to do it. It was just something that came from inside me. And that can be a little bit more difficult to to wrap your, your, your brain around, right? Like, my kid is really motivated by drawing. He really likes to draw. Well... Where, where did that come from? You know, it's so much more internal than saying, well, my kid really likes the iPad or my kid really likes the goldfish crackers, you know, and it just feels a little bit harder to tease out. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think you're exactly right. And I think that in an assessment situation, sometimes it's hard to get to those intrinsic motivators, but it's definitely something that you can figure out as you're working with a child in therapy. And it's the most important thing for me is to figure out what 
makes this, this kiddo motivated or excited. And a lot of times I'll tell my therapists that work for me or, you know, clinicians that I'm supervising, if you see a child smile or laugh, you have to follow that and remember that and take note of that because that shows you some of their intrinsic motivators, right? Um, you know, when they're really excited and they're smiling or they're laughing, um, that's something that we can, we can utilize and follow the child's lead. Um, two kids came to mind when we were talking about intrinsic motivation. Um, I have this one kiddo and he just loves praise. He really loves when he does the right thing. And I think just generally kids love, you know, doing the right thing and they love, you know, making adults around them proud. And so I have, um, we have this little like happy dance that we do for one of the kids who like, if he does something right, we'll go like, yeah, 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 yeah. And we'll like do a little dance and he loves it. And so he'll, he'll work for that. Um, Um, There's no external motivators needed because he just loves when we do our little like happy dance for him. Um, I have this other little kid who is so cute. He has autism and, um, and, and that's something else before I explain this, this case, I feel like a lot of times we think kids with autism, they're not motivated by internal motivators. Um, and that's just not true. I think that it's harder sometimes to find those internal motivators, but they're definitely there. Um, so this kid that I'm thinking about, he and I, every time he does something correct or that I like, and I want to give him praise, uh, we'll put our foreheads together and I make this really high pitched yes sound. So I'll go, yes. And he, I don't know what it is about that routine, but he loves it. And every time I do it, he smiles and it's just, it's so cute and it's so easy. Um, but those are two ways that I build rapport with you know, some of my clients and I just, it has nothing to do with toys or games or even token boards. Um, it's just, they're really excited to do the right thing. (laughs) Okay. Now I've got this picture of you doing the floss during your, (laughs) (laughs) uh, and then you got a bunch of kids around you doing the floss. Um, so I, I think maybe one of the big differences between external motivations and internal motivations is that if it's, if it's in, intrinsic to you, it means it can't be forced upon you, you know, meaning mm-hmm. um, it, so often I see in classrooms, the, the teacher has objectives they have to hit. They put students in these situations where they are in these learning experiences where the kid maybe doesn't want to be there, but they have to do it because these are their goals, right? And so teachers are in a tough spot where they're trying to design instruction that gets kids internally motivated but they're using these external motivators to get them going in the situation. And I just wonder maybe the way to mix that is to follow the student's lead. We've heard that that term before, just follow what the student wants to do because they'll lead you to what their internal motivators are. Does that sound right? It does. And I wonder, I wonder too, how we can, we can balance that because I feel like I'm not always intrinsically motivated, right? Like sometimes I want a cup of coffee and that's a reward for me for going to the gym in the morning. Um, so I just think that it's important to, to balance both of those, knowing that not every day and every moment a child will be intrinsically motivated because some, some days the happy dance isn't enough for the kid that I work with. Most of the time it is because he loves that routine, but sometimes he's just like tired or not, not into it. Um, and so I think that it's, how can we balance that? And I think that it's easy to rely on those external motivators, but we really have to make it an effort to get to the bottom of what is intrinsically motivated. And when kids are really having a great day to really put, put aside the external motivators um, and really try to build that, that muscle of intrinsic motivation, because we know that that's what's going to carry, carry any individual a lot further. And they'll be a lot more excited to talk um, and talk about the things that we are trying to teach them and absorb the things that we're trying to teach them if it comes from an intrinsic place. Yeah, you know, another phrase that I hear quite a bit from teachers or parents or is that, yeah, my kid would just sit and do that all day long. They would do that all week long. You know, my my own son, right? He likes video games like most kids do. I, I could hear like someone go, oh yeah, he would just sit down there and play Spider-Man all day long. But the truth is he wouldn't, you know, like he eventually would grow bored of it. He's motivated to play it. Some way it's fun for him to play but eventually he'd want to go do something else. You know, Um, no matter what you're intrinsically motivated by, your interest might vary and change and you might become motivated by something else right within a given time span. You know, that might be universally true of, of, of humans. Like we don't give kids enough time to just try that. Like I could see that like, Oh, in, a, in an autism program, 
this student with autism, he would just sit there and rock all day and stim on the iPad all day if I just let him. So I have to provide some external motivations. But maybe he wouldn't, you know, maybe if you tr tested that out for today and just see how long he would sit there. I wonder before how, how long before he'd get up and actually move and go find something else to do. But we just never take the time to really let students become uh, masters of their own domain that way and, and, and get bored enough to go find the next motivator for themselves. Yeah. And I, and I feel like it's because of the external pressure, right? Teachers are so pressured to hit certain standards, to meet certain goals. Um, and I feel the same way, you know, a parent is coming to me and they have me for 60 minutes and you know, I need to do something, right? I like as much as I want to follow the child's lead. If, if the child leads me to, you know, the corner, just stimming on balloons, then I need to like try at least to, to pique their interest in some ways. Um, so I think, you know, it just goes back to a balance. Um, and also realizing that sometimes we don't get to do what's motivating to us. And I think that comes back to more of an academic place. Um, these are things that teachers really need to hang on to as speech language pathologists you know, our job is communication. While we do have to meet goals and certain criterion for our students to make progress, we also need to remember that we need to give the foundation of communication and that involves finding motivating things. You know, kids might not be motivated to learn their ABCs or learn how to add numbers together. Um, they have to learn those things anyway, but communication needs to start from a motivating place. Um, otherwise it's just not going to stick and we can just teach kids how to, you know, say certain phrases or certain words in certain routines, but they're not actually going to learn those language concepts. Yeah. That's the why, right? It's the why of communication and there has to be some sort of motivation or why would you do it? Right? So what happens, Rachel, when the student's motivation and the teacher's motivation clashes, for instance? So let's take you have a student that's really motivated by trucks or a certain food item or uh, robots or whatever the word might be. And so they go to their communication device and they want to hit that button over and over and over again because that's what they like. You know, they like vehicles. So they go to the vehicles section and they start hitting the words vehicles. And the teacher's like, yeah, but no, I need you to talk about numbers or I need you to talk about uh, the things that you, uh, the, the, the body parts or whatever. So what do we do in that situation? Um, this is a tricky one because this uh, is one of the, n the number one questions I get asked. Because I work with kids with autism so much, they tend to perseverate um, both verbally and on devices. And that's the first thing I say is that, you know, if this child who's nonverbal with autism was talking, they would be saying these things over and over again. Um, you know, it just so happens that we have a piece of technology that we're able to take buttons away or mute buttons or mute the device. I mean, things like this, which you should not be doing. Um, but we weren't, we're, we're not able to do that with kids who are verbal. You know, that's the first thing I tell parents and teachers if they were verbal, unfortunately, we'd be having to figure out what to do in this situation. And what will we do if a child kept saying, you know, robot, 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 robot over and over again? Um, you know, we would say, we're not talking about robots right now. Like, or we might attribute meaning to it. Like, I know you just played with the robot, um, but now we have to learn about, you know, numbers. It's math time. Um, so I think that that's the first step. Um, there's some other kind of tricks of the trade that I use for kids who are perseverating. Um, sometimes just flipping the device over as like a reset and then, you know, bringing it back forward um, is enough to kind of break the perseveration. But it's, it's really challenging. And I think that it's something that we really need to balance. Teachers are motivated to have kids talk about academic things. And sometimes kids aren't interested in talking about academic things. It doesn't mean that we don't give children all of their favorite motivators uh, on their devices. Um, I have a kiddo who is obsessed with trash trucks and he says trash truck all the time. And ABA was like, let's take trash truck off. I said, absolutely not. This kid's obsessed with trash trucks. Why would I take off his favorite thing? Um, that makes no sense. You know, it, and yes, he does use it inappropriately and at times where he should not be talking about trash trucks. Um, but it doesn't mean that we don't give him access to say that. You know, if he was verbal, we wouldn't be able to take that word out of his mouth. So it's just so important to remember that um, it's a balance. And unfortunately, it's, we have to strike that balance by, you know, using the kind of strategies that we have. But also just realizing it's going to happen. You know, as kids 
learn and grow, they stop perseverating so much, you know, and these kids are emergent communicators. I think that's the other important thing to remember. These kids are just starting to learn how to talk on their devices. So babbling on their devices is a developmentally appropriate thing to be doing. Um, you know, just because they're seven years old doesn't mean, um, you know, they're not at a stage of babbling if we just introduce them to a device. So Rachel, speaking of motivation, I am getting super motivated to go to FETC and ATIA. That's coming right up when this podcast episode airs. It'll be next week that I'll be at FETC and ATIA. And I'm getting to do a bunch of sessions down there. One of them, Rachel, is uh, about AAC. Uh, it's with uh, Chris and Sean. Remember the AAC agreements episode? Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're bringing that back. We're going to talk about that. There's an ed camp happening there. We're going to do AAC agreements again, version three. The people are going to come to that session and work on research uh, to support the existing agreements and come up with a, some sort of process. To, if you, ha you think there should be another agreement that we just haven't done before or that should be considered, we're going to try and put a committee together to start thinking about those agreements. So that's all happening at ATIA. Um, and I'm also doing a pre-conference there. There's that, that one you have to sign up for early. Uh, that's called um, uh, the Right Assistive Technology for Note-Taking, like right on. And it's with Beth Poss and uh, Misty Rail. So Beth Poss is from the Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland and Misty Rail's up in Alaska, Rachel. That's Pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah. I'm really sad I'm going to miss it, Chris. Um, I'm having such FOMO right now that I'm not going to be at ATIA and FEC with you. You know, I feel like everyone everyone thinks of us as a pair now, a duo, which I appreciate. Um, so we need to make it to a conference together one day. Absolutely, absolutely. And maybe what we can do is I'll try and do a Facebook Live there. We'll mm -hmm. pick a time. We'll figure out. We, this way we can be there at least digitally together, or virtually. You know. Exactly. Um, so if you guys haven't already, sign up for our Facebook group because there's lots of really interesting conversations and we're going to start doing more live events. Now, Rachel, we also have another big announcement here in 2019, and that is we finally put together what we're calling Podcast to Professional Development Series. Do you want to, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, Pod to PD for short. But the great thing about listening to our podcast is that you can now, for certain podcast episodes, you can go to Exceptional Ed and take a 10-question quiz and you can earn CEUs. So if you're an avid listener of our podcast, all you have to do is go take a, a quiz um, and you can earn CEU credits, which is super exciting. Yeah, you know, this has always bothered me, Rachel, for, for years. You know, I've been podcasting for the longest time, and it always bothered me that it, someone who is driving in the car or listening on their exercise bike or their treadmill or whatever, they didn't get the professional development credit for the people that would come see me live. You know, if I stayed after school and you spent an hour with Chris, you get PD credit. But if you spend an hour in your car listening to Chris, no, you don't get the PD credit. And, and I felt that way for all the other people that I'm listening to. Like, how come I can't get credit for listening to their podcast? That's me doing professional development. So this is a way of bridging that gap is that we've provided the, the, our listeners with a way to get professional development credit just from listening to the podcast. Exactly. And we know that SLPs and AAC specialists, they're really busy, right? And they're driving around and they're listening to podcasts. I feel like everyone's listening to podcasts now. They're so trendy. But yeah, why not earn CEUs? It's, it's just a different medium for learning. And I'm really excited that we are starting to offer these courses um, because I just think it's a great way for people who have already listened to every episode of our podcast to just earn the CEUs they need for their year. So the first course we have, we only have one course up right now at the time of this recording, but that course is, what we did is we took the round table of our Core Words podcast and we stripped out all the advertisements, so it's just the content. And we also took the first part of the AAC agreements episode we did, and we put that together into a course. So if you go back and listen to those episodes, or you can just go to Exceptional Ed, and you can get all that information, those podcast episodes right there on the podcast site, on the Exceptional Ed site, you can get all that content together. You can then go listen and take the quiz. All of that we've put at this website. It's bit.ly slash TWT Core PD. That's bit.ly slash TWT core PD. Go there. You'll be able to see it all and you'll be able to take the quiz and get credit. And we're really excited because we're going to start offering a lot more of these courses. So if you have an idea about a course that you would love us to do, um, let us know. You could join our Facebook group and send us a message. You can email us. Um, but we're really interested in 
giving you guys credit for the things that you want to learn about. Um, so definitely keep in the loop, keep listening. We will let you know on air whenever we have a new course release. Um, we'll also blast out on our social media channels. Um, but I'm just so excited. I think everyone's really excited too. I've had a lot of people asking me questions and sending me emails like, what's this whole like podcast PD thing, CEUs? Um, so now we're finally ready to unveil. We should mention, Rachel, that the content is free, right? I mean, the podcast episode is already out. You can go back and listen to it. The AAC Agreements podcast episode is out. You can go back and listen to that. The, to take the course and to take the quiz, that costs a little money. It's a $25 to take the course. Uh, and then you get your, your professional development credit and you get your um, certificate that says you participated in the course that you can then use to prove to anyone that you need to that you took the course. Speaking of courses, we have a course coming up, Chris. Yeah, we sure do. So we have a course called the ABCs of AAC, which is going to be part of the SLP to B conference, which is being put on by Exceptional Ed. Yeah, and it's really great for new clinicians, CFY clinicians, uh, graduate students. Um, we're going to be doing the, a the ABCs of AAC, which is just um, a really clever way of talking about the foundational concepts that you need to know. Um, so if you know somebody who's just starting out um, learning about AAC, it's going to be a really great course for them. Um, so please do share it with people who you think might benefit from foundational concepts. The conference is from February 4th to February 8th, and our talk is on February 7th. It is at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Um, so please do join us if you are interested in learning uh, some foundational concepts of AAC. Just go to slp2bconference.com to register and use the code XEDSLP2B19 to get all the courses for free. So that's slp2bconference.com and the code is XEDSLP2B19. Is that the number two, Chris? Yeah, that's a numeral two, not the word two. And it's also the letter B, not like the, the little insect or the word like, you know, the uh, like am and B. No, it's the letter B. Okay, good to know. So today's interview is with Dr. Beal, who our producer, Luke Paget is found because he's one of the professors at his university. Right, Rachel? Yeah, I'm really excited. So he talked to us all about motivation and he actually works with adult clients. It's really interesting how motivation really transcends any age group. And so he had a lot of really valuable insight. I was really excited to have him on the podcast. So without further ado, let's head into the interview with Dr. Beal. So before we head into the interview, here's a quick message from Exception. Ed. Do you have an idea for a product or book? Or are you ready to go beyond in-service presentations? Well, how do you get started? And what if you don't have any business experience at all? Well, I have some great news for you. I'm Mailing Chan, and I'm getting the nitty-gritty stories from parents, teachers, therapists, advocates, and people with disabilities who have created successful businesses, and they're sharing their intimate stories with you. Listen to us on the Exceptional Leaders Podcast and fast-track creating and building and sharing your idea with the world so that you can help more people. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined by Chris Bugay. How are you doing, Chris? Great, Rachel. It's always great when we get to do an interview together. I am so excited. We have Mike Beal here. Hi, hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm so good. Today, we're talking about all things motivation, and I'm super excited uh, to have Mike on to talk about and pick his brain about motivation. So I guess let's just start off, Mike, by having you explain a little bit about yourself and how you got to, to doing what you're doing. Sure, sure. So... Um, I've been a speech pathologist since 1993, and I worked in the, for the Veterans Affair basically until 2012, sorry, 2010, and then worked uh, per diem and full-time at UCLA. I am still have a practice, per diem practice at UCLA, see outpatient adults with neurogenic communication problems. And uh, since 2012, I have also been a professor at Cal State Northridge. After being a therapist for, I guess, about 20 years, I decided that it would be nice to teach people how to be a therapist. 
But that being said, I, I personally still feel that it's important for me to maintain a caseload of patients. If I'm going to be standing up and telling others how to do therapy, I should be dealing with the how to do it myself on a regular basis. So that's my, my basic uh, background. And, and the motivation stuff, for anybody who's ever heard me talk about motivation, I've been talking about it a lot in, in different venues. There really was one specific point in time where I kind of had a bit of an epiphany. I was in my office at the VA in Pittsburgh, and towards the end of the day, one of my colleagues came into my office, and we were chatting, and she was seeing a fairly young man who had had a stroke and had aphasia. I asked her how, how he was doing. She said, well, he's not doing so great. He's kind of plateaued. And I said, oh, really? Why? She said, well, he just doesn't seem very motivated. And I kind of nodded my head in acknowledgement, and we went on to talk about other things. As soon as the door closed behind her, and I, it's crazy, I still have this. I had this kind of little epiphany that I had been in that conversation hundreds of times, both on the giving and receiving end, where as therapists, we were ascribing why someone did well or didn't do well to their motivation. And at that time, I was just finishing up my clinical doctorate degree in speech pathology from the University of Pittsburgh. And so I was very much about trying to be a, an evidence-based therapist. And, you know, more than it striking me that I'd been in that conversation so many times, what really struck me was I thought it was a really important factor and I had never read a damn thing about it. Um, and that was crazy considering all of the reading I do about every other aspect of my practice. And in some ways, so crazy because at the time, and I still certainly feel this way now, I always thought that motivation was the thing that mostly determined the outcomes that my clients had. You know, I spent so much of my career trying to find that treatment that would unlock my patient's potential and kind of a search for the Holy Grail, you know, and that's not a bad search, but, you know, I think I recognized that that search was not the right direction. You know, we have decent treatments, um, but people have to do them. And people have to be engaged in them and they have to persist over long periods of time. It's not rocket science. You know, I think that for whatever reason, speech pathologists, and I think this is true for OTs and the PTs that I know, are very comfortable following their intuition when it comes to thinking about how to motivate people. And I think most of the time, or, or much of the time, their, their intuitions are correct. But sometimes, and enough, where I think it's an issue, People, I think, do the wrong things out of good intentions. So around 2010, I, I just dove into the literature on the science of motivation. I realized real quickly that there was absolutely nothing in our profession about it. So it's been eight years of kind of, you know, uh, reading the psychology literature and educational psychology and whatnot. And, and I'll say that it's been by far the thing that's most transformed my practice in a, in a positive way. I, I feel much more comfortable in my skin as a therapist than I ever have. And I think partly it's because that constant struggle to motivate people and to get them to really do, the you know, really be involved in their own rehabilitation and you know, was such a constant thorn in my side. And, uh, you know, not that I, I can say that I've, you know, solved that problem, but I'm not guessing much anymore. And that feels better. Well, yeah. Dr. Beal, I got to say there, you, I think are struck a nerve here because I, literally today I had the conversation that you were just referencing where talking to a speech therapist and a teacher in a, in a high school, with a student that is age 20 
And they were saying, you know, she's just not motivated to communicate. She's just not motivated to use that device. She's just not motivated to do anything. She'd just be happy to sit here all day and smile at us. And just like you said, I'm like, geez, how many more times am I going to have this conversation about, about motivation? So what are some of the insights that, uh, that you're not guessing about anymore? What are some of the, the takeaways that I could be telling these people? Well, I, you know, it's a really big topic. Motivation is, there, there are a number of different theories of motivation. I have kind of decided for my own practice and for the people that I see that one theory in, in particular, self-determination theory, seems to be both a really good match um, for the problems I run up against. And also, at least from my experience, it seems to be one of the more well-validated and studied theories. And I think, you know, before I kind of talk about any of this stuff, I think, you know, for people who genuinely want to add this to their practice, that understanding the theory is really what will help you implement it in your practice. I think there is a, a big tendency in our field to want to be given steps of things to do. And I think more and more for me in my practice, and, and it's not just related to motivation, but related to trying to help my adults with language impairments, aphasia, that earlier in my career, I did, you know, a lot of reading about different treatments and trying to find the right treatment. And these days, I, I think I tell my students that understanding theories really well is just more useful because when you really understand a theory, you really understand why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. at least from a certain theoretical perspective, and hopefully one that's well validated. And when you read treatment studies and people talking about treatment, you understand why that treatment might work or not work. Because let's say you understand how language works in the mind if you're thinking about aphasia. If I want to modify a treatment, understanding the theory, it, I know how to do that and still remain true to that treatment. So sorry for the little detour here, but I feel pretty strongly about that. So self-determination theory is interesting and different from other theories of motivation in, in a few ways. One of the most important ways is that it sees motivation a bit different than other theories. So other theories tend to see motivation as one unitary thing whether someone acts or not and persists in their goal pursuit will be dependent on how strong their motivation is, how much motivation they have. Self-determination theory says, well, you know, how much motivation you have is certainly a factor, but what's more important is the quality or the kind of motivation that you have. In a nutshell, they divide motivation into what we would call autonomous motivation and um, controlled motivation. So, you know, autonomous motivation is where I'm acting because I want to do it. And controlled forms of motivation is where I'm acting because I feel some pressure to do it. Someone has told me I need to do it. Someone has told me I should do it. Maybe even I've internalized that voice in my head. And that voice in my head is telling me I should do this. But should feeling is very different than genuinely desiring to do something. And in general, the, the research on the effects of these different kinds of motivation is that when people are in this positive uh, autonomous forms of motivation, they persist more in their goal pursuits, even in the face of different challenges and barriers. They learn in a deeper way. Their learning tends to be more conceptual rather than, let's say, kind of rote memorization. In other words, when they learn something, they learn why that information is important and how to use it and how it's relevant to them. 
Dr. And Beale, I, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to use a, an example there of my own uh, experience with podcasting. Since we, uh, you said you have a podcast, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I know when I first was listening to podcasts back in like 2005, I was like, hmm, I think I might want to try one of these. I think I could do this. And so I just started doing it. There was no, I just felt like I wanted to do it. And I learned, I went out and I started reading books and listening to podcasts on podcasting. It was something internal to me because I wanted to learn it. It was something, like you said, autonomous. It wasn't because I wanted some sort of uh, external motivation, like I want to make money from from revenue from sponsorships or anything. It was like that would be another way to, I guess, someone would want to do a podcast, but that wasn't me. And I feel like I learned so much more because no one was forcing me to do it. It was just all something that was generated from inside myself. Is that a good example of... For sure. And, you know, your experience, because you genuinely wanted to do that, your experience while doing it is going to be different than if you didn't really want to do it, but you felt like you had to do it. I mean, we all, this is not news to anybody, but I think making that kind of distinction is important because a lot of the ways that we engage with people in therapy can overtly or covertly put pressure on people to to behave in certain ways now controlled forms of motivation will motivate people the the thing is is that usually whenever that motivating force is now no longer present the person ceases the activity because there's the whatever the pressure was is gone you know so I, I, I kind of see this in some of my patients who I, I think are in more of that controlled form of motivation. Now with apps, you know, we can monitor people's, well, how much they're practicing at home. And for my patients who do use an app, and, and when I have that ability, you know, sometimes I'll see people who have this pattern of not doing any of their home practice until the day before they're supposed to come see me. And to me, that's a, like a really one of those signs that, they're not really doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they feel like they should. They want my approval. That's uh, always a dynamic and or often a dynamic in therapy. You know, so yeah, controlled forms of motivation. And, you know, in the most extreme, we're talking about threats of punishment or using rewards to string people along. And, and, and it works. It's just not very lasting or um, deep, I guess. I'm certain there's certain certain therapies. There's one that I'm thinking of that begins with an A and ends with an A that a lot of students with autism go through that that would um, or participate in, uh, often not by choice. They're they're placed there by a by a parent or a caregiver. And like you said, is there a lasting benefit to 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 that? Like it seems to be working. You're collecting data and there's progress, and so you're making progress towards a goal. But does that generalize outside? And that is, uh, I think, a big uh, question with that particular therapy. Just to tie it back to, um, yeah. to to something real that that uh, that I think many therapists are dealing with right now. Yeah, and and you know, one of the the other benefits of these autonomous forms of motivation is a sense of a psychological sense of well being and even vitality. And of course, controlled forms of motivation tends to be the opposite. The, that kind of motivation tends to make people have more negative emotions and feelings of stress and frustrations. So, yeah, we can get people to do things, but one of the primary bioethic principles of being a therapist is do no harm. And although we don't do physical, you know, we don't do physical harm, but and clearly if there's any, you know, you don't want to start to say that people doing this kind of therapy are doing psychological harm, but I think they should be aware of whether they are or they aren't. Um, I have a question. So I, I really liked your example of um, kind of some telltale signs that, you know, we're not uh, operating under the autonomous motivation. You know, somebody who waits to the last minute to, to do their homework, for example. So in a situation like that, can you kind of lead us through your clinical decision-making process? How do you try to shift from, you know, a more controlled motivation to more autonomous? Like what kind of, you know, decision-making do you go through to figure that out? Sure, sure. 
Well, so just to, to, to stick with the theory here a little bit more, and I'll be as, as brief as I can. So, f- for example, if as a therapist, we're always recommending things. Right? We're always recommending things. And the question is, is when that person takes our recommendation, how deeply are they going to internalize it? If they internalize it really deeply to the extent to which they identify with it, with that reason, then, we're, then they will genuinely self-endorse doing it themselves. So, so this is a process in psychology that's called internalization. And, you know, it's one of the most basic kind of psychological processes, right? As humans, we're always taking in the beliefs, values, and practices of people that are important to us and adopting them as our own. I mean, that's childhood. So one of the ways that, according to self-determination theory, that we can facilitate this deeper internalization is by satisfying our clients' basic psychological needs in the context of therapy. And self-determination theory has identified three basic psychological needs, although they're open to identifying more. These are just the three that they have the evidence to talk about. And that is the need for autonomy, the need to feel that I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to do it. And I'm not feeling coerced to do it in any way. It's genuinely my choice then the need to feel competent, the need to feel that uh, I can achieve those things that I want to do. And in particular, competence, the need for competence is satisfied when we are successful at something that we perceive as being a bit of a challenge, right? And doing something that we know is super easy doesn't really satisfy our need to feel competent. Brushing my teeth doesn't make me feel any more competent. You know, but writing a paper and getting it published, that satisfies my need for competence. And then finally, the, the need for relatedness, the need to feel that there are people who care about me unconditionally, whether I'm a good mic or a bad mic. And that, of course, I, there are people that I care about unconditionally. You know, that last one, my MO as a therapist was something like this. I might spend all you know, part of Sunday making a bunch of treatment materials for you, particularly before the days of apps. You know, I was making treatment materials in PowerPoint, something like that, put on people's computers. And I'm also you know, very proud of what I made, and give it to my client, and they seem appreciative. And then they come back the next week, and I say, you know, how'd it go? And they tell me, well, they, you know, they didn't get around to doing it. And... You know, I would never berate somebody, even though inside I was probably feeling a bit ticked off. But my, so my MO would be just to kind of just get a little bit more distant, just become a little bit colder. It was real super subtle, but I know now my patients, our patients are really good at usually, my patients are really good at reading me. Yeah. And, and the emotion, the verbal and nonverbal and, you know, emotional signals that I'm sending. So satisfying someone's need for relatedness means that I'm the kind of therapist where that, my warmth towards you in this context is not altered by anything that you do. And of course, that's quite a practice, uh, almost a mindfulness-based practice on my part, because I have tendencies, you know, and I have to keep them in check. But, uh, you know, sticking with that dynamic, you know, if, if, I, if that's the kind of therapist that I am, and our clients want us to like them, um, just because I think as humans, we tend to just want the approval of others. But also, there's more to it because my patients are vulnerable, and they, f- they, they think that I'm the one that's going to really help change their lives. And so they, I think, really want me to care about them and like them, and they don't want to do anything that will endanger them. So this natural need for my clients to want my uh, approval, that leads them to a form of controlled motivation. They're um, motivated to do something to avoid some kind of a punishment in a sense, you know, my disapproval, 
you know, I think for my clients, they usually have a mixture of factors that are autonomous and controlled that are motivating them. And, you know, clinically what's most important is, you know, which ones are predominant. So those are the the three basic psychological needs. And within each one, self-determination theory has talked about different ways that we can satisfy those needs. For example, the need for autonomy, you know, there is listening as if you're really trying to see the world through your patient's eyes. A different kind of listening, a different quality of listening. And that satisfies their need for autonomy because when we listen that carefully and intently and with concern to people, it signifies our respect for their autonomy. Relatedness too, right? We're making a connection that uh, yeah. I'm listening to. I, I have empathy for you and now we, are relate, we have a relationship. That's right. So these needs are, you know, they're, they're fairly interrelated, providing a, a meaningful rationales for why we want people to do things. That's another big one in my, you know, we can get deep into these topics. There's a, a nice systematic review paper in, in the psychology literature that is a deep study into just the nature of rationales given in therapy and what about rationales make them more autonomy supportive or more motivating or not. Um, and that's been the really interesting thing about this topic for me is just how much it's really helped me understand how to do therapy. Not, not necessarily what to do, but how to give feedback. I mean, there's a whole broad literature out there on just the influence of feedback on people's motivation. And, you know, of course, this is stuff that we just don't get anything close to that in our training. You know. Dr. Beale, I have some experience here that I'd like to, to share in that um, I, oftentimes I, I find myself giving evidence or uh, research or I will rationalize some sort of uh, suggestion that I'm making. And over the years, I've found that people, despite knowing that they shouldn't do it, they continue to do it. Or despite knowing they should do it, they continue not to do it. It's sort of like the equation I make is like, hey, uh, stop smoking, you know, yeah. or just don't do those drugs, you know. It's not as simple as just telling people. People know the rationale that I shouldn't eat these four cookies that are sitting here in front of me, but I'm still going to eat these four cookies, you know. So part of me feels like uh, as, a, as a therapist and as a coach for people is that I have to Trick is a bad word, but I have to create the experiences that allow them to come to it on their own without just doing it because I tell you to and because you know it's the right way to do it. Is that, does that equate with something that you're, that you're thinking about? I think, or that you I think so. I mean, I think it's important to say, and, and one of the co-authors of Self-Determination Theory, Edward D.C., has a nice brief 15-minute TED Talk that you can find on YouTube. And in that talk, he says, he makes a point that we don't motivate and to think that we are motivating people is the wrong way to think about it. All we can do as therapists is support our clients' innate motivation to show up and, and stop doing the things that get in the way. Because I think in some ways, as much of like, what do you do as a therapist is, what do you stop doing? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, people, you know, we make recommendations and, and people acknowledge that this is a good thing to do, but they, you know, oftentimes don't do it. I think for me at the beginning of therapy, the beginning of that relationship with the adults that I work with, I spend a lot of time on education because more and more it's clear to me that people can't genuinely disagree with something. I mean, genuinely agree, unless they really understand the context, they really understand why I'm making that recommendation and how it would benefit them. You know, in an ideal world, my patients would understand the, the research as well as I do. And if they did understand the research as well as I do, they could come to a genuine agreement on my recommendations. 
I think the other thing I've noticed is that I kind of always have to be educating in some way because it takes my clients a long time to get it. If, if I'm the kind of therapist that does support these psychological needs that they have in the context of therapy, that they are, are more likely to, to come to that realization on their own. You know, I have to be willing to completely respect their not wanting to go down that path. You know, if I have done my job of listening, when I started consciously trying to be a better listener, you know, one of the things, for example, is that instead of my initial session with the patient being, you know, 10 minutes of interview and data gathering and then the rest giving tests, right? Because I have to write a report after my first session with them. Now I, I talk to them for, you know, three quarters of the time, do maybe one little subtest just to say I did something. Um, you know, that, that time is spent really hearing their story. And, you know, I just noticed that now when it's time for me to give rationales, because I understand my patient better, I can, I'm probably better able to word the rationale in, the way, in a way that kind of comes from their perspective. And that is, as far as autonomy support, you know, rationales are only autonomy supportive if people feel like they've incorporated their perspective on things and their experiences. Sometimes, clearly, you know, we, we recommend things that people may not want to do. And there is a little bit of research out there on something like, how can you get people to feel autonomously motivated about something that's boring? that they don't really want to do. And the few studies that are out there have su suggested that, well, you know, you, ha you, you should give one of these good uh, rationales, acknowledge the person's negative feelings about doing that, and avoid using any controlling language. You need, you must, you should, and Again, you know, there are limits to anything that we can do as a therapist, but from that self-determination theory perspective, you know, when we're recommending things that we don't think people want to do, um, those are the kind of the key ingredients, along with that kind of um, space we've created in our office where our patients have had many experiences of us satisfying those needs that they have. You think about yourself, you know, you know, if your doctor really cares about you and you really feel it, and then when they go to make a recommendation, you are much more likely to adopt it than the doctor who comes in, barely looks at you, he's on the computer, typing away while he asks you a few questions and you're in and out in 10 minutes. Yeah. Dr. B, you touched on something that I thought was uh, particularly interesting is about the words we choose to use. Like you said, um, you know, don't use controlling language like must or need. And uh, I find that, that that's verbal and also in reports, though, it's often you said, we, are, we, we as therapists are often charged with the task of giving people recommendations. Not yeah. that we would write it in a way of need or must, but even you should consider or something like that. Uh, something that I found is useful, and I'd be curious if you, again, know any research about it or if you have any thoughts about it, is the idea of asking more questions than giving statements at all. So I, what made you do that? Or why did you think of going that way? Or uh, how, does that res how, does, how did that help you achieve what you're trying to do as opposed to saying you should do this or that? I, what are your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the things, um, ways my practice has changed is I just ask really basic questions that I, for whatever reason, I never really asked before, like, do you think this is working? Do you think therapy's, do you think therapy's helping you? You know, and, and, you know, have the space where people can, you know, feel free to say yes, you know, no. If they say yes or no, you know, well, okay, why? You think it's helping? Tell me how and why you think it's helping you. And, and that's another autonomy supportive practice is, you know, actively seeking our clients' opinions. You know, that being said, I think 
there is also research out there that suggests that for individuals who are of lower ability, that we have to be careful not to overwhelm them. Because if we overwhelm them with choices or questions, that practice itself will make them feel less competent in responding, less confident in uh, make competent of being able to make a choice. So um, I think that's kind of a caveat to this practice of really trying to be client-centered and collaborative is I think we can do too much of it. You know, we also have to recognize that our relationship with our clients evolves and it has stages. You know, in the beginning, um, I might want to be more taking charge and more giving uh, my client a feeling of being really supported and that there's a structure here that, that they can rest in. Because I know the baggage my clients come in to my office with. The, be the beliefs they have, like, I'm going to fix them, I'm going to do something to them, I've got the answers, <laughs> you know. If they only could listen inside my head, they'd run away. <laughs> um, you know. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there's an art to implementing some of these ideas. Um, you know, for sure in the acute phase right after a stroke. I mean, I'm not going to go in and try and be super collaborative with people. They don't want that. They want me to take charge and not feel the security of somebody taking charge. But, you know, I know that that, that has a time and a place, and I can gently start to introduce, you know, the, the, the way I want our relationship to evolve. Dr. Beal, again, that parallels exactly what I, my experience is in the schools working with uh, parents and teachers is that at first with communication devices. They want to perceive me coming in as the person that, that is going to give them direction, and I often do. Here are the things you should do, and here are the things you should stop doing. And we're going to make these tweaks right now. And here's the theory why we're going to do all of that. In fact, oftentimes mm -hmm. I start with a theory and then get into the, the, the action items of what you're going to change. But that's only after the first two to three sessions. And then I start to shift it where I start to ask more of those questions and ask, how is it going? And what's, how's that strategy working for you? And, and what changes are you making? And it, 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 the, the relationship switches from being more directive to me being more passive, which sounds exactly what, uh, again, parallels what you're doing in your practice. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, the ideal session is one in which I don't make any choices. My patient makes all the decisions, and I'm just there to give my input if I think it's a wrong decision, where they're doing all of the assessment of how well they're doing. And, you know, I'm not doing the assessment. You know, that's the ideal. I, I do think, you know, when we have to be careful with, because I do the same. You know, I, I talk about research and I might talk about a theory, but, you know, again, I think we always have to be sensitive to overwhelming our clients and their caregivers. You know, having the skill to help people understand ideas maybe in, in words that, you know, in more layman's terms and doing whatever we need to do to, to sense when they have achieved an adequate level of understanding and not just base it off of, the, you know, asking them, do you understand me? And then saying yes. I mean, you know, there's so, so much politeness that goes on in therapy that, you know, uh, you can't believe everything that they say. So that's important to me, yeah. One of the things that I um, like to do, because I work a lot with parents uh, in my practice, and I work a lot with teachers too, and I think a really simple strategy is just to say, like, how's it going? Or how's it been going since last time? Because um, I feel like there's a lot of details in the way that they respond. Um, you know, sometimes they're really excited. They're like, I can't believe that, like, this strategy worked. And 
So you could tell they're really eager. They're eager for more, in which case I would probably as a therapist say, okay, like I can give them a little bit more homework next time or, you know, maybe expand what we're doing versus a parent who comes and sits down and just like they, they reek of, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't take one more thing. And so I think it's just really important to have those check-ins. Um, it seems like a natural, you know, human inclination, right? Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times, especially if we have high caseloads, we're not really thinking through that lens. We're thinking, okay, I have to see this client and I have to make these goals, you know, achieve these goals and make progress. And I think that there's just a simple question of how's it going. Um, you can get so much content information from that question. Yeah. And it's always nice to remember it's much easier to talk about being a therapist than actually doing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for me again, I think a dynamic I, I noticed is if I ask somebody, how, how is it going? Do they genuinely feel free to, to be honest with me? Or has something about the way we're relating make them feel the need to say something I want to hear? And so I think, I need, I think everybody kind of understands that and, and, and knows that, that that goes on sometimes. Um, uh, for some of my clients, it's, it's hard for them to be, to kind of have that relationship with a healthcare provider. And uh, they're not going to open up and be honest with me right away. I suspect some kids are like that too, because kids are so used to feeling like their job is to get the approval of adults. Mm -hmm. and, and they really have so few opportunities, perhaps, to be genuinely honest and truthful without repercussions. You might even wonder if, if one doesn't feed the other as an adult, meaning you go through so many years of childhood learning to follow the rules and seek approval, and um, you're not asked uh, a lot of autonomous questions if that doesn't then lead over to who you are as an adult. You know, um, I see that a lot in that uh, how classrooms are designed is often, and, and therapists in the schools, maybe how it's designed is... Uh, I'm the leader because I'm the therapist or I'm the teacher and you're the student. So you do what I say. I think that that is changing. I think there are some classrooms and there's some definitely new uh, ways of, of learning and teaching that have, have changed that model where they're trying to be a more student centered approach and where the student is in charge and the teacher is more of a guide on the side, if you will. But I still think that's, that, that's, we're still a long way from that being the prevalent way of how education works. Yeah. And from a self-determination theory perspective, I think they'd say, you know, it's not about kind of a free-for-all, uh, you know, where everybody just gets to choose in, let's say, the context of education. What also satisfies people's need for, to feel competent is a, a structure, that there is a structure there, and, and it's a structure that is supportive. And, and with kids, that does mean limits, too. Of course, we want to give them rationale for limits, you know, and, and rationales that from their perspective, they could hopefully understand. But, you know, I just kind of want to make the point that from this theory's perspective, it's not about just letting people do whatever they want and having some kind of free-for-all. People don't feel, that doesn't help people feel very confident that they can achieve anything in therapy if, if they get a sense that, you know, their sessions are just kind of chaos or that there isn't a, an organized kind of structure there that's supportive. I have a, another question. What would you say? I feel like I probably Chris can relate to this. Um, we get a lot of that child's not motivated by anything. Mm. What would you say to a teacher or a parent or someone who said that statement? Well, you know, there've been a, a trying to remember his first name, his name was what last name was Weppman, famous aphasiologist from the 50s. Of course, this is kind of at the beginning of aphasia treatment. And in one of his books on aphasia therapy, he, he talked about motivation. And he said that for those patients who don't seem to be motivated, it's the therapist's responsibility to figure out how to, let's say, support their motivation. Of course, understanding that there are always just limits to what we can do with uh, an, an other kinds of motivation that fit under this rubric of autonomous and controlled are intrinsic motivation and, and extrinsic motivation. And 
when we're intrinsically motivated, we're doing something because the act itself is interesting, enjoyable, satisfying in some way. So when you go dancing, you, you go dancing because there's the pleasure of dancing, not because you expect some kind of outcome after you're done dancing. Uh, whereas extrinsic motivation is, is you are doing it for the outcome. You're going to work, not necessarily because you like to go to work, but, but because of a paycheck. You are reading this paper, let's say, on your Saturday for you know, something speech pathology-wise. You don't really want to spend your time doing that, but you value the outcome of the knowledge that that might give you. So extrinsic motivation is not bad. It describes a lot of adult life. The, the, the question is, is whether it's autonomous whether those goals, those outcomes we're seeking are things that you know, we genuinely want. Extrinsic motivation can be autonomous or controlled. Intrinsic motivation is always autonomous. So of course, I think um, a lot of therapists try to motivate um, both adults and probably children by trying to make the activities more interesting. And I think that's fine. I, I don't know how how long that can last or how far that will get you, you know, without having experience with this age group, you know, I would probably spend my time trying to understand that child as, as much as possible and perhaps give them the tangible experience that I am trying to understand them, not because I want to manipulate them later on. Kids pick up on that, right? but because somehow I just care and I want to know. And then maybe from whatever understanding you get, then, then you can make some kind of decisions. But I think that, you know, because we're in a hurry and because we have big caseloads, I think many of us have never really had the opportunity or rarely have the opportunity to really get to know somebody, a patient, and really let them tell their story long enough and, and explore in enough detail about who they are and what they want. We've never, few of us really have that experience. You know, if we can find the time to do it, there's gold there often. Not to mention the fact that just the act of doing it makes people trust us. Rachel, your, your question was so poignant because I hear it all the time. I think one of the things we have to start with is the, the, the idea that it's never the student's fault. Uh, so, so often I hear, or the, or the client's fault, or the patient's fault, whoever it is. So, so often I hear that, that phrase, you know, hey, uh, this student's just not motivated to do anything. And it seems like sometimes people use that as an excuse, or as that, like, it, that's the end, period. The student's not motivated, so therefore I'm off the hook. Or really what you said, Dr. Beal, is, no, it's, it's the therapist's responsibility. So the next question becomes, if someone says, well, the student's just not motivated, I think my response is, and what are you going to do about that? You know, like, what's the next step? How are we going to engineer the environment? So I think that's one takeaway from the conversation. The second one I think that rings in my mind is, you said, Dr. Beal, you said, um, well, some people want to make it more fun, right? Like, make it more interesting. And mm -hmm. so often I see that in school, too, uh, the, 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 this thought of, well, I'll just make my therapy more engaging. If I do some sort of a song and dance and I have flying monkeys going behind me, then the kids will they'll be enjoy it and then they'll, they'll change. Um, and I think that lasts for a little while, but it doesn't persist because what's much more lasting is the idea that it's not necessarily designing an engaging activity, but designing an empowering one. So when, when I give you, again, somehow try and shape the experience that the student is coming into or that the client is coming into so that my ultimate goal is for them to be more autonomous. I, I think that's what I'm getting at is the, yeah. the empowering aspect. Well, I think we have to find out what our clients want to achieve because, of course, when we talk about motivation, it's goal-oriented. There's reasons why people do things. For my clients, if I just ask them something like, well, why do you – why do, you, why do you want therapy? Why do you want to work on this or that? You know, I usually get, you know, kind of the pat answers. You know, I, I want to speak like I used to or whatever. I'll, I'll give an example. And this, I wrote a book chapter a few years ago on motivation and, and aphasia rehab. And I used a, a case. I think it illustrates this nicely. 
he was in therapy with somebody else. And after a couple months, this therapist discharged him because she basically said he wasn't motivated for treatment. He wasn't doing any of his home practice, et cetera. I start to see him. He kind of acknowledged that he wasn't doing his home practice, but he wasn't really sure why. He, he, he did feel like he wanted to improve his speech. It took a lot of time just talking to him before all of a sudden he started to talk about his grandson and how his difficulty speaking, his grandson was, he feared perceiving him a little bit differently and that their close bond was starting to erode, which can happen in aphasia. But as soon as he started to talk about his grandson, I could see the, a change in his body, his voice. I kind of knew we landed on you know, something important. And to make a long story short, the goal of therapy for him was to get close to his grandson. And it just so happened that speech, improving his communication was the way to do that. But working on his, improving his communication wasn't the goal. The goal was emotional bond with his grandson. And, you know, once we identified that goal, good goal, everything else just was a uh, fell into place. You, can, you know, if you could talk to him about baseball, do you think that would help you bond? Yeah, yeah, you know, okay, so you know, now we've got a vocabulary of words that we can work on. You know, my point here is, is that it's hard to find. For me, goal setting is the hardest part of therapy finding a really meaningful and powerful goal for somebody. People don't know that coming. They don't know it themselves coming into our office. And so part of my job is just to help them reflect enough and keep talking enough that that stuff bubbles up. As humans, we're on automatic pilot most of our lives. We're just not that reflective. <laughs> but we as therapists can create the structure and the time for people to reflect. And I believe kids can be reflective too, but they, there has to be the time and the opportunity for them to do it in enough time. I agree. And I also think that we sometimes think about pediatric populations and think, oh, like they couldn't possibly reflect or they don't understand, you know, the rationale for why we're doing something. Um, but it's always been my stance to just, you know, it doesn't matter. We can say those words, either they can understand or they will understand one day. Um, so I think it's really important to talk about why we're doing things and to just assume that they have an understanding behind it because eventually they will. Right. And then eventually they can do things like reflect on the things that we're doing and, and things like that. And I guess, you know, if we're going to err in any direction, we should err on the side of respecting people's autonomy. You know, exactly. That's, that's a big message of our podcast. <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah. any final thoughts you know for the therapists out there who um you know want to do something that will transform their practice give yourself a few years to really read this literature from my experience and the therapists that i mentor where we talk about this a lot it's changed their practice too it's in, in some ways, it's the most important part of therapy. I'm sold. I'm excited. <laughs> that be all I'm in. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for being here. Sure thing. Yeah, thank, thanks. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. So we will absolutely link to all those resources that you share with us in the show notes. Uh, we will also link to your podcast. Um, I'm so excited to, to have another podcast to put on my docket of, of ones to listen to. Um, and thank you again so much for, for agreeing to, to join us today. Your insight has been really invaluable. And I think it's such an important topic um, that we could talk about forever, <laughs> I feel like. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for having me. Thank Absolutely. you. Right. So for Talking With Tech, I'm here with Chris Bouguet and Mike Beal. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you guys next week. You're listening to the Exceptional Podcast Network.